just want to welcome everyone here today. Uh, see a few guests in our audience, some who haven't been here for a while, some who have returned, especially, do you see Sydney Taylor down here? Sydney Taylor graduated last year from Kaufman High School, and, or not Kaufman, where'd you grow? She graduated anyway. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just assume, okay, but she graduated. She's in the military, she's in the Navy, she's, on, she's passed through her basic training and all that. She's on leave for a couple more weeks, and then she's going to be going to her next destination, and it's a really rough place. She's going to have to go Hawaii, but somebody has to do it, right? So I think Tiffany's planning on going out there to visit her sometime when she's in Hawaii. Going to be there about three years, but we're glad to have her here. And uh, if you're a guest, your first time, or I see some who have returned, a cup, you've been here before, we're very, very happy to have you here today. We're so glad. Uh, and as James said earlier in the announcements, we are not a perfect church. Uh, that's because I'm here and because other people are here, and we are imperfect. But... We do believe, the Bible teaches, God counts us as perfect when we're in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important, if you have not yet made a decision to follow Jesus, that you do that before it's eternally too late. Well, we're almost at the end of this series. Next Sunday will be the last in this series of God is moving us. Is He moving you? And of course, by moving us, we're literally going to be moving this year. Still looks like it's going to be the first part of July sometime. We've already purchased the First Baptist Church building in downtown Kaufman. We're going to be moving there. It's a lot bigger facility, more parking, more classroom space, more everything. And so God is moving us, and we believe that God had a hand in that process. In fact, uh, I think it's unmistakable that He had a hand in that process, if you, if you know uh, kind of how all that worked out. But more importantly, we all need to ask, is God moving you? Let me ask you a question. We're in the second month of a new year. The new year is just over 11% completed, if you do the math. 11% of the year is completed. In this first month or so that's been completed of this new year, has God been moving and working in your life? That is what God wants. He wants to work in our life. The question is, are we allowing Him to move and to work in our life? And we've been talking about this year, one of the things that keeps us from allowing God to move and work in our life the way He wants to is because there are certain sins that are hard to identify. We all know what the big sins are, you know, the Ten Commandments, and those are bad things. But the truth of the matter is, most of us who are sitting in this room, those aren't things that we typically struggle with, murder and those kinds of things, you know, those are bad. Our problem is, and we all have this problem, our problem is these sins that we call respectable sins. Things that our society doesn't think are that big of a deal. Some of them are listed up here, and I've preached about some of them over the last couple of weeks. These are things that are hard to identify, they're hard to get a grip on, because we don't see them in ourselves a lot of times, and our society doesn't think that they are all that big of a deal. But God thinks that these things are a really, really big deal. And they can cause our life not to allow God to move and to work in our life the way that He wants us to. Today I'm going to talk about one of these respectable sins that everybody in here can identify with. Every one of us in here has this problem from time to time. Every one of us in here is going to be able to identify with everything that I say today. This sin that I'm going to talk about today is a sin that our society does not think is a big deal at all because it is so commonplace. And even in churches, apparently, we don't think it is all that big of a deal because it's so commonplace in our churches as well. And this sin that I'm going to talk about today this thing that we don't think is a big deal, this has the absolute power, if we understand what we're going to look at today, has the power to change everything about us. This sin that we're going to look at today, and if we make the changes to this area of our life, has the power to control everything else in our whole life. I bet everybody in here right now, uh, we probably made some New Year's resolutions, maybe forgot about them already. We're, you know, 42 days into the, into the year. But uh, those New Year's resolutions you made, I bet everybody in here had some kind of uh, personal habit 
or some kind of thinking pattern, something about yourself, you're like, I need to change that. And you probably already experienced some frustration in not being able to deal with it the way you want to, right? Today, what we're going to look at, if we can get a grip on this one thing, and you're going to see as I unfold this lesson, if we can get a grip on this one thing, it holds the key to controlling everything else in our life. Now, do I have your interest? I bet you're thinking, what in the world is it that is so important that if I get a grip on this one thing, I, this is the means to controlling everything else in your life. And it is. I'm going to show you plainly. Scripture says that. Here's what it is. This is our problem. Everybody in here can identify with this. All of us in here have a problem with controlling our tongue from time to time. And one of the reasons that this is such a problem is because our society doesn't think that this is a big deal. Does it? Our society is pretty loose with their tongues. Wouldn't everybody agree with that? And also, it shouldn't be this way, but it is. Even in our churches, apparently we don't think that this is all that big of a deal. Because even church members like myself and you, everybody in here, we're all guilty, let's admit it. Part of the means of being able to overcome a problem is recognizing that you have a problem. We don't think that this is all that big of a deal. But brothers and sisters, we need to look and see what God says. And God thinks this is a really, really big deal. One of my favorite books in the Bible is the book of Proverbs. Proverbs is a book, it's a manual that God is giving to us for here's how your life is going to go better if you will follow this manual. And I've studied the book of Proverbs backwards, forwards, upside down, and sideways. Taught on and on here in a Wednesday night this past year. And the number one subject in Proverbs that comes up more than any other subject by far is the subject of our words and the tongue. In fact, depending on who you listen to, there are between 60 and 90 references in the book of Proverbs to controlling your tongue and to the words and the things that we say. Just look at a couple of these verses. We're only going to look at a couple of them. Proverbs 18.21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death. You can do great harm with your tongue. It has the power of death. You can also do great good with your tongue. Great positive things can be done with your tongue. It has the power of life and death. And then he says in 21.23, those who guard their mouths and their tongues, they keep themselves from calamity. So here's why everybody needs to listen this morning. If you're a guest here this morning and you're wondering, is this one of those preachers that preaches for an hour and a half and goes on and on and on? Let me, let me assure you, no, I'm not one of those kind of preachers. Usually my sermons are right about 30 minutes, sometimes a little bit less. Every once in a while I get a wild hair and go a little bit longer, but usually it's going to be about 30 minutes. So in the next few minutes, it's not going to be all that long. I'm going to talk about how we can help prevent calamity in our lives. Our words have tremendous power. And so that's why you need to listen today, because if you want your life to go a lot better, if you want things to be better in your life, to keep yourself from calamity, as this verse says, I hope that you'll listen today. Now, I heard this joke this week, and this is a really good one. It's one I've never told you before. I sometimes wonder, did my church thinks, well, did he forget that he told us this before? But I heard this good joke. There was a, an elderly man, and uh, he got real, real sick. He got pneumonia, and you know, that can be real serious for an elderly person. And he was in the hospital, and he was just going downhill, and it was looking pretty bad. In fact, it got so bad, uh, that they called the minister in and they called all the family to come in. And so they all go into this room and before the family comes in, the minister goes into the man's room and he stands beside the man's bed and the man couldn't even talk when he got there. And uh, the man wrote on a piece of paper, he wrote something and gave it to the man and right then the man expired. And so the minister just took that piece of paper and he put it in his pocket. He thought, I'm going to read these as his last words at the funeral. And so a couple of days later at the funeral, they're all gathered together there, and they're all remembering this great man and everything. And the preacher was going on and on. And finally he said, and here were his last words to us. And he pulls out this piece of paper and he said, you are standing on my oxygen tube. <laughs> words are important. Words are really important. They literally have the power of life and death. 
And I love this great verse from Jesus. Look what Jesus said. This is serious stuff. He said, I say to you that for every idle word that men may speak, they'll give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you'll be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. And do you know what an idle word is? Have you ever thought about idle words? What's he talking about when he's talking about an idle word? An idle word, the word idle means something you're doing when you're just kind of lounging. You're not paying much attention. It's words that we don't give a whole lot of thought to. We haven't thought a whole lot about it. We say it just without even thinking. We say it in casual conversation. We need to pay close attention to those idle words because Jesus said every idle word that you and I speak we're going to give an account of that and the reason is because God knows our words have power they have real power they can literally change the the whole course and the whole direction of a person's life so you need to pay close attention to your words he says and today we're going to focus mostly on one passage of Scripture and it's the words of Jesus' brother, James, in the book of James. James has this passage in chapter 3, verse 1 through 12. And this is what we're going to focus on. These are some of the most powerful words in all of Scripture about how we can tame our tongue and how it's going to benefit our lives. But to give us a little bit of context, I think this verse is really important. Earlier in James, he said this. Those who consider themselves religious, that would be you and me. We're all here on a Sunday morning. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues, they deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Have you ever thought about the fact that your tongue can tell and show and is an indicator of whether or not your religion and your devotion to God is really worthless or not worthless? James, an inspired writer, says it is a big indicator. The problem is, though, that people in our society, people in Kaufman, don't think it's a big deal. This was made manifest to me this past week. I'm not going to mention the name of the person because most of you would know who this person is. But I was having a, well, a, a conversation with a very well-known person in our town this week. If I mention this person's name, everybody, oh yeah, I know who that is. And this is a nice guy. I like this person. This is a very religious person, not a member of our church, but we were having this conversation. Well, it was, it was evident in the conversation, we got into a spiritual discussion, by his choice of words, a couple of words that just kind of slipped out, you know, that weren't uh, appropriate. I reminded him subtly later in the conversation, I'm a preacher, and then his words got a little bit better. But part of the nature of the conversation was also that he didn't think words were all that big of a deal. He thought people who were Christians should kind of, you know, well, you know, you cuss a little bit, you do this a little bit, it's really not that big of a deal. And I was trying to be sympathetic to him and listen to him and not blow him off, but at the same time I said, well, you know, and by, I'd been working on this sermon also that week. <laughs> you know, our words do matter. Our words are a big deal. And one of the reasons this is such a subtle sin for us is because it's one of these respectable sins. Even those who are religious don't think it's all that big a deal. And yet an inspired writer right here says, if we don't keep, keep a tight rein on what we say, it means our religion is worthless. So let's look at what James says. James says, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what he says is perfect. He is able to keep their whole body in check. And I underline that word, that little phrase right there, their whole body. Here's something that James is saying, as I mentioned at the outset of the sermon. He's going to use this terminology, the whole body. The tongue is connected to everything else. And if you can get control of this one thing, he's saying, you can get control of your whole body. You can get control of every issue you have. And the reason he says right here that not many of you should become teachers, it's not because he's against having teachers. I mean, I'm beginning a teacher training class this coming Wednesday night. It's because he knows that the words we speak are important and they're powerful. 
Don't take your words lightly. You need to make sure that you understand that the words that you are saying, that you're broadcasting out there, they are having influence and they are having impact on the lives of other people. I found this great quote this week from one of the commentaries that I was using. And this is a, a short little quote, but I want you to listen to this. It talks about the power of the tongue and how it literally is so all-encompassing it affects our whole being. Listen to what he says. He says, the tongue is so much more than what we actually say out loud. In fact, actual speech is probably only a small percentage of the use of the tongue. We can't think without formulating thoughts in words. We can't plan without describing to ourselves step by step what we intend to do. We cannot imagine without painting a word picture before our inward eyes. We can't write a letter or a book without taking it through, without talking it through our minds onto the paper. We can't resent without fueling the fires of resentment in words addressed to ourselves. We can't feel sorry for ourselves without listening to the self-pitying voice which tells us how hard done by that we are. But if our tongue were so well under control that it refused to formulate the words of self-pity, the images of lustfulness, the thoughts of anger and resentment, then these things would be cut down before they have ever had a chance to live. The master switch, he's talking about the tongue, has deprived them of any of the power to switch on that side of their lives. The control of the tongue is the means to spiritual maturity. And I think that little quote did a good job of talking about how our tongue affects everything that we do. That's why it is the key. It's the key to getting your whole body in check, as he says right here. He continues and he says, When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn, once again, the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they're so large, they're driven by strong winds, they are steered. And by that, though he doesn't use the word whole, that's what he means. The entire ship is steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Once again, something that is so small, like our tongues, affects every thing else about you. If you can get that one thing under control, you can get it all under control. He says in verse 5 to 6, Likewise, or in a similar way, as he's talking about the ships and the bits in the horse's mouths, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest, and by that he means the whole forest. It's set on fire by a very small spark. The tongue also is a fire. It's a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body. And the whole course of one's life has been set on fire and is set on fire by hell. Now, I want to give you an illustration. Right here, right now, those guys who are sitting back at the sound booth, there's a bunch of controls back there. There are controls that control the projectors and they control the lights and all that. And there's a different light switch for every one of these lights in here. If they wanted to right now, they could turn off just certain of these lights. They could turn off the ones up here. They could turn off the PowerPoint lights, and you guys would have plenty of light. Or they could make y'all dark, and there'd be light up here. But you know what? There's another room in this church building. It's right back there in the closet. And there's a big breaker box back there. And there's a master switch back there. And all you have to do is flip that one switch, and everything in this church building goes off. It's the master switch. That's what our tongue is. Our tongue is the master switch that controls everything. That's what he's saying. Notice how often throughout this whole section of verses here that we've been looking at, how he uses the word, he connects the fact that something so little controls everything else. It controls the whole, the entire, the whole. He uses this over <coughs> and over and over again. Our tongue is the master switch. And then he says in verse 7 and 8, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, sea creatures, are being tamed, and they have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now, the first time I read that, I thought, then if no human being can tame it, then why are we even talking about it? If God's desire is for you and me to have our tongues tamed, and this verse says that no human being can do that, then why are we even here? Why are we wasting our time? Preacher, why don't you let us out early? Here's the point. I can't tame my tongue by my own power and by my own resources. 
But that's what he's trying to point us to. You can't do it in and of yourself. And we've all tried, haven't we? But with God's help and with God's power, your tongue can be tamed and it leads to the taming of everything else about you. And so the one thing that I really want to get across today, which is what James is saying, it's what Jesus is saying, it's what Proverbs is saying. The key to controlling your life is controlling your tongue. This is important. Everybody in here has different issues. Everybody in here has different struggles going on in your life. There are different habits that people have. Then we know they're bad habits. And we've tried to control them, and we haven't been able to do it. James says, God, through God, inspired from God, he says the key to controlling your life is controlling your tongue. Think about it for a second. Those who have an anger control problem, which is a lot of people, if you control your tongue, you'll control that anger problem. Think about it for a minute. Aren't they closely connected? Don't you find that when you get angry, your tongue starts getting out of control? God says, I'll tell you what, if you'll focus on this one thing, you focus on controlling that tongue, it's the master switch. It will control everything else. And if anger is not your problem, you may have a host or, or some other problem. And everybody in there has different ones. Instead of trying to focus on everything, focus on this one thing. He says, if you'll focus on controlling that tongue, everything is connected to that. That is the key, he says. And then he says in verse 9 and 10, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. He's talking about our inconsistency. And our inconsistency can do great harm. We praise God. We sing songs of praise to Him like we've done this morning. And it very well could happen that as soon as we get out of the parking lot, maybe even before we get out of the parking lot, we'll be cursing human beings or saying very negative, unkind, hurtful things to human beings. And these are human beings who have been created in the likeness of God. They've been created by God. That is so inconsistent. I think this is a good little thing to remember. We've all seen this before, but look at this. Before you speak, think, and it spells out this acronym, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? And is it kind? Even though it may not be a curse word, is it really necessary for us to say that? Even though it may not be a curse word, is it kind? Is it helpful? Before we speak, we need to practice this. I think it's really good. We need to think. And then the last thing he says, he says, Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. Here's the concept I think he's trying to get across here, and this is really important. <coughs> Let's just say that up here right now that there was a well over here and it just had the best, coolest, most refreshing spring water in the world. And I dipped a cup out of that, out of that spring. But then over here on the other side is this yucky, muddy, sludgy, gross water. And I took a cup out of that and I mixed the two together. One has great water in it. One has bad water in it. Would anybody in here want to drink out of it? Here's what happens, and this is what he's saying right here in this verse. That which is negative, that which is harmful, influences even that which is good. And you're not going to, even though this has good water in it, it also has that bad water. The bad water overcomes the good. It's been told, or I read this statistic this week, that it takes seven compliments to overcome one negative thing that we say to a person. We tend to hold on to the negative, don't we? That's what we remember. We go over that in our mind. It takes seven positive, complimentary things to say to a person to overcome one negative thing. So once again, he's saying the key to controlling your life, to controlling everything about your life, whatever your problem is, the key to controlling that is controlling your tongue. Now, I don't know what your issue in here is this morning. We all have different issues. Some of us are impatient, like me. Some of us have different issues. 
a whole host of issues, but regardless of what the issue is, the tongue is tied to all of it. The master switch, the key to controlling everything, regardless of what your issue is that you're struggling with right now. You tried lots of things and it hasn't worked. Try this. The key to controlling your life is controlling your tongue. If you'll just focus on that one thing, it's tied and connected to everything else. Now, that's what God wants us to know. But a sermon is no good if you just know something and you don't do anything. What does God want us to do? He wants to allow us to let Him to move in our life so that we'll tame our tongue. If we just have knowledge, say, well, okay, that's good. We go out there and don't do anything. What good is the sermon? The teaching from God's Word is only good if we put it into practice. And so we need to allow God to move and work in our lives to tame our tongue. And here's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to give all of us an exercise. See, I believe the key to us putting it into practice, because what some of you are probably asking right now, and it's a legitimate question, is, okay, how do I do it, preacher? It says, let God move to tame your tongue. How do I do that? How do I let God move in my life to tame the tongue? A couple of weeks ago, I brought up a verse from Psalms chapter 19. And it talks about how I have hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. If you don't have God's word in your heart, you can't recall those words at key times in your life when you're trying to overcome whatever the sin temptation is at the time. The key is to have God's word in our heart. So I'm going to give us a key verse today, and it's this verse. Ephesians 4.29. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Here's the challenge I want to give all of us today. And I want to give a real specific challenge. For one week, starting right now, starting right now during this service, let's do this verse. Do not let any unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth. Don't let any unkind word proceed out of your mouth. Don't let any negative word proceed out of your mouth. Don't let any condescending word proceed out of your mouth. Don't let any word that is, puts other people in a negative light proceed out of your mouth. Sometimes the words that we have are so unkind and sometimes they're just they're kind of arrogant and condescending. It might not be, the word might not be a curse word, but it's just kind of, you know, it just has a bad flavor about it towards another person. If we would all right now practice this, it would change our whole demeanor and the whole demeanor of our whole congregation. How many of you are going to do it? Starting right now. And we're going to have to watch it because this is one of those subtle sins because we have a tendency to say these little negative jabs at people, don't we? Well, you know what? That preacher didn't have a tie on this morning. Can you believe that? Little negative con Did y'all know? You didn't notice that? Yeah, preacher, can you believe that? Well, how ungodly of a man is he? Didn't even wear a tie to church. We have a tendency to say these little negative... Or did you notice the song selection of that song leader this morning? Or did you notice those verses that preacher gave up there? He even used the NIV. He didn't use the version I wanted. And we just have a tendency to criticize every little nitpicking thing and to complain and to gripe and to say things in a negative tone. This verse says, this is from God, don't let any unwholesome word. Unwholesome doesn't just mean curse words. It includes that. But words that tear down people, that are negative and demeaning and derogatory, don't let any unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth but only a word that's going to build other people up. So here's my challenge to all of us today, beginning right now for the next week. Because a week is something that's measurable. If I just said for the rest of the year, well, that's too big of a chunk to bite off. But for a week? Can we do this for a week? I'm going to watch everything I say. I'm not going to let unkind thoughts translate into unkind words. I'm not going to tear people down. I'm not going to assume the worst of people, which we sometimes do. I'm not going to assume that I know what their motives are, which we have a bad tendency of doing. Well, I know what he's thinking. I know what she's thinking. Really? Do you? You're God? 
Don't let any unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth. And if we can do it for a week, then we think, you know what, I did that. I experienced victory over that. I did it for a whole week. I think I could do it for the rest of February. And then we do it for the rest of February. And then, hey, maybe I can, I'm going to go the whole month of March. And before you know it, it becomes a habit and becomes a lifestyle. And it has the, the ability to change our whole life. This is my challenge for all of us today. More importantly, it's not my challenge. These are not my words. These are God's words. This is God's challenge to all of us today. And I hope we'll all take it to heart. If you need to respond to the Lord's words today, maybe He has moved in your heart today. Maybe you've seen the need to make some changes in your life. And if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, the biggest change that you need to make is to be in a relationship with Jesus. Because I said at the beginning of the service, there's not a perfect one here. None of us are perfect. None of us deserves to go to heaven. But if you're in a relationship with Jesus Christ, you get to go because of His grace and His mercy. That is why it is so important. So if you need to respond to the Lord in any kind of way today, allow Him to move in your heart. I pray that you do so at this time. Let's all stand together while we're singing this song of invitation. Mm -hmm.